John chapter 14, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 16. I want you to pay careful attention to what Jesus is saying here in this passage. John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. And then Jesus identifies who this Comforter will be. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. He's speaking to his disciples here. He said, you know the spirit of truth, because he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then Jesus summarized it all by saying, I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you. Praise God. Now to break down this passage and understand it a little bit better, we have to remember that God is a spirit. A spirit has no flesh nor bone. A spirit does not have a body. A spirit does not have blood. God is a spirit. And the Spirit overshadowed Mary and caused her to conceive. And the Scripture said that holy thing that was born of her was called the Son of God. So we have the Father, which is a Spirit, which is invisible, which caused Mary to conceive and bring forth a Son. The Spirit lived inside of Jesus. That's why He said, I and my Father are one. That's why he said, the Father dwelleth in me, and all that I do, I do under the power and the authority of the Father. He said, I can't speak unless the Father speaks through me. I can't work unless the Father works through me. So we are not speaking about two different persons or three different persons here. Jesus is saying, I'm going to talk to the Spirit, the Father. And he's going to send you a comforter because I'm going to go away. And that comforter is the spirit of truth or the Holy Ghost whom the world cannot receive because it can't see him nor does it know him. But you know him for he dwells with you now and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Praise God. By the help of the Lord this morning, I want to preach to you, is Jesus with you or is he in you? Is Jesus with you or is he in you? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to be together. I thank you for all of these who have gathered here today. I pray, Lord, as we break the bread of life, that you would anoint the ears of every hearer. Let it go deep into our spirit today. Let your word settle into our hearts. Let it make a difference in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me as the vessel that you are choosing to use at this moment to break the bread of life, to minister the word of God, Lord, let my thoughts be anointed. Let my words be anointed. Let my mind and my spirit, Lord, be all a part of what you desire to do here today. Help us to hear. Help us to receive. And let the will of God be done. And let souls be born into the kingdom today. We give you the praise and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. Now make no mistake today, it is both a great and a desirable thing for God to be with us. 
If God is not with us, we are in serious trouble. When we go throughout our day, if the Lord is not guiding us and directing us, if He is not with us, if His angels are not surrounding us, then we've got trouble, friends. And I want God to be with me everywhere that I go, in everything that I do. And I would imagine your desire is the same. In the Old Testament, one of the greatest promises that was ever given was given to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5 as he was taking over after Moses had been taken away. And God spoke spoke to Joshua in this passage, and he said, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. One of the greatest, most comforting things Joshua could have heard is that the same God that was with Moses was also with him and that he would go forth with the power of God on his side. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 57, Solomon, the king of Israel, prayed this prayer. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us. There were many people in the Old Testament that the Bible tells us God was with them and that they worked and walked with God. Enoch, the scripture said, walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The Bible said Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God, and God took him away while he was still alive. It was a type of the rapture of the church. The Bible speaks to us of Abraham, who was called a friend of God, and certainly Abraham knew what it was to have God with him. We've already mentioned Moses, the leader of Israel, whom God was with. And Samson, a mighty judge of Israel, God was with him. There were many others in the Old Testament, Noah and Jacob, Joseph, Gideon, David, Elijah, Solomon, Jehoshaphat, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah, and many, many others. In fact, in the Old Testament, the only thing God could be was with human beings. At the close of the Old Covenant, the 12 disciples of Jesus were distinctly privileged to walk in the flesh with Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered what it must have been like to walk with Jesus throughout Galilee and and, uh, Jerusalem and all of the places that Jesus went, Cana and, and different places? Can you imagine what it must have been like to be with Him in the flesh? (laughs) Amen. When you understand that Jesus was more than just a rabbi. He was more than just a prophet or a healer or a teacher. When you understand that Jesus was the Word of God made flesh, He was all of God incarnate in a man. He was the God-man conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of a virgin. And that holy thing which was born of her was called the Son of God. Jesus, the Bible said, would be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And Paul tells us that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and received up into glory. When those men walked with Jesus, they were walking with God. They were walking with God incarnate in the flesh. Amen. God with us. And after three years of following Jesus as his disciples, after three years of walking with him in this earth, 
Jesus began to speak to them in John 14 concerning the fact that he must go away. The chapter opens with these words, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then he said, I go away. I suspect that the disciples probably didn't hear much after he said, I go away. The rest of the sentence was, I go away to prepare a place for you so that where I am there ye may be also. But it's likely they probably didn't hear that very clearly because all they could think about was Jesus is going away. This man that we gave up everything for, this man that we left home and family and job to follow around on this earth, this man that we've been with for three and a half years, he's now going to go away? What does that mean for me? What's going to happen to me now? What's going to happen to those of us who have left everything to follow him? How disconcerting that news must have been for the 12. Uh, all of the miracles would now be over. What would their lives be like now without Jesus. But then as they were trying to process these words, I'm going away, Jesus began to tell them things too wonderful for them to comprehend. First, he said to them, my power is still available. I'm not going to take my power away when I go away. In fact, he said, I say to you, if you believe on me, the works that I do, will you do also? And greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my Father and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Uh, hallelujah. He was trying to help them understand. You don't have to worry. I'm going away, but my power is going to remain with you. And then in verse 17, he said, I will not only be with you uh, when I go away, but I'm going to be in you. Praise God. When he said in our, as we read in our text, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him because he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. In other words, uh, don't be troubled. Don't be distressed. Uh, don't worry because uh, a greater experience than you have ever known is coming to you. Hallelujah. I am with you now, but I shall be in you. Praise God. As the disciples continued through the next few days, <coughs> they witnessed the arrest and the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus Christ. And surely there were some of them who thought to themselves, it's all over now. He's been killed. He's been buried. The Bible tells us that they didn't really remember what he had told them about his burial and his resurrection. They didn't remember that he said in three days, I'm going to come back to life again. And so they're going through all of this, troubled in their minds, even though Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. It was difficult not to be troubled. As they're watching all of this and they're thinking about it all, amen. But then sure enough, on the third day, Jesus did rise from the dead. And when they went to the grave to try to find him, all they found there were two men dressed in white apparel that said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here for he is risen. He is alive. Hallelujah. And then Jesus began to appear to them and he came 
to them on several different occasions. Finally, he gathered over 500 of them on the Mount of Olives. And in their very sight, he ascended up into heaven. But before he went away, he said, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Hallelujah. The promise of the Father will come upon you. And then he ascended up into heaven. And while they stood there looking after him, gazing up into the heaven, there were those two men in white apparel again who said, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? Go to Jerusalem like he told you. For this same Jesus that you have seen go away into heaven will come again in like manner as you have seen him go. And so they finally get the message. They go to Jerusalem. They gather in the upper room. Uh, Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, there were 120 of them gathered there. I'm not sure what happened to the other 380, but in in any respect, uh, there were 120 gathered in the upper room, and they began to pray, and they began to make supplication, and they began to seek God. Uh, Hallelujah. And with 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all gathered in one place, uh, in one accord, uh, and suddenly there came a a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind uh, that filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. Uh, They were all filled. Uh, They were all filled uh, with the Holy Ghost uh, and began to speak with other tongues uh, as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Hallelujah. Praise God. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came for the very first time into the hearts of human beings. The Bible tells us in John 7 that it couldn't happen until Jesus was crucified and ascended into the heavens. And Jesus had given them the promise in John 14 that another comforter would come, the Spirit of truth. I can only imagine the scene that day as the Holy Ghost came upon them and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. The Bible tells us they were acting like drunk men because the crowd thought they were drunk. They were rejoicing. They were spinning. They were shouting. They were dancing. And I'm convinced that a big part of the reason for their rejoicing was because they recognized that spirit that had settled upon them. Hallelujah. They recognized it as the same spirit they had felt when Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. They recognized it as the same spirit they had felt when he caused the lame to walk and when he raised the dead. They said, this is indeed the same spirit that was with us. But now it's not just with us, it is in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus was not just with them anymore. He was now in them. And they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The tragedy of our day is that many people are content to only have Jesus with them. Many churches throughout the valley today, people will gather together, 
They will sing songs. They will lift up the name of Jesus. And believe it or not, the presence of God will come into the room. And they will feel Jesus with them. But they'll walk out of the building stuck in the Old Testament having never experienced the New Testament promise of the Father. Because you see, the will of God is not to only dwell with us, but to dwell in us. Hallelujah. He wants to fill us to overflowing with the Spirit of the one true and living God. He wants us to experience the power of God inside of our being. Hallelujah. You see, when Jesus is only with us, we are still filled with the works of the flesh. We are still filled with carnality, and our humanity rules, and sin reigns. But when Jesus comes inside of us, He displaces sin. He displaces carnality. He displaces our humanity. And when we are in Christ, we become new creatures. We are a brand new creation. Hallelujah. Old things pass away and all things become new. Praise God. Not only that, if Jesus is only with us, There is no rapture power in us. Romans chapter 8 says, If we have not the Spirit of Christ, we are none of His. If we are not filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, there is nothing in us to connect with the Spirit of God when Jesus Christ steps out on the eastern cloud one day and says to the bride, come up hither. Without the Spirit of God in us, there will be nothing to recognize His voice when He calls us. You see, it is absolutely essential. It's really not an option. It's really not voluntary. It's really not something we can do without if we want to. We must have the Spirit of Christ in us. Hallelujah. And then we are under divine control. And then the Bible says sin has no power over us because the law of sin is broken by the power of Christ living inside of us. Hallelujah. Somebody said, well, you know, you have to sin a little bit every day. Would you please show me chapter and verse for that? It is possible to live above sin. It is the will of God that the law of sin be broken. It is the will of God that the bondage of sin Amen. No longer hold us that we be released from the bonds and the chains of sin. But the only way that can happen is when the Spirit of Christ lives in us. Hallelujah. 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 And if we have received the Holy Ghost and we're still struggling with the works of the flesh, that means our spiritual fuel tanks are low and we need to be refueled and refilled with the Holy Ghost because when Christ is in us, the Bible said we are filled with the power of God. We are filled with the fruit of the Spirit. We have a sound mind according to Second Timothy. We have the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. We have righteousness and we have hope. All of that comes along with the Holy Ghost when He comes inside of us. <coughs> Hebrews 11 
verse 32 through 38, ties it all together for us. As the writer of Hebrews begins to speak of Old Testament heroes of the faith, people who had God with them, he said, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder or cut in half, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Yeah, wow, that's right, wow. I've never been in a den full of hungry lions. Have you? I've never been stoned or tortured. Have you? I've never been thrown into a fiery furnace where the fire was so hot that it killed the guards that threw them in. Have you? And when I read that list, I think, how can I ever stand with men and women like that? What tremendous things were experienced by these people of the Old Testament who only had God with them. All of these marvelous occurrences displays, amazing displays of power beyond our imagination of the things that have happened in the lives of men who simply had God with them. But look at verse 39 where it said, These all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. I want you to understand today, friends, those heroes of the faith who did such marvelous, outstanding, wonderful things, the miracles that happened in their lives, without somebody in the New Testament having been filled with the Holy Ghost, without somebody in the New Testament having Christ come inside of them, those people could not be saved. Their salvation depends on you and me. And if we decide, I'm just going to go on living, having God with me, that's good enough for me. I'll take the blessings that he'll give me when he's with me. If we decide that, we're putting somebody else's salvation at jeopardy because they without us cannot be made perfect. They did not receive the promise of the Father. Hallelujah. Spoken of by Jesus to his followers in Acts 1, 4, and 5. They did not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. These great people who had God with them and experienced great things, believe it or not, had the lesser experience with God. God having provided some 
better thing for us. The Holy Ghost, Christ in us, is the better thing. And not only is it a better thing, it is the completion of God's plan. The Old Testament saints need the New Testament saints' experience of receiving the Holy Ghost to be made perfect. So my question to you today, is God with you or is He in you? Have you been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidenced initially by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance? If not, you only have God with you. While though it is a good thing, there is a better thing, and that is to have God in you.